device is going, so we're live there. Okay, um, now let's start with just um, first sharing with individuals. We know League of Women Voters have been out here protecting rights of voters for many, many years. Tell us who is the League of Women Voters and what their mission and goals are around their work. The League is made up of volunteers, much like Women for Progress, and it's people who care about their community. We have been around for a while because this is our 100th year mm. when women were given, not given, when they gained the right to vote in 1920. It was Carrie Chapman Catt that knew that women needed to be educated to make, make uh, sound decisions when they went to the polls. So they started the League of Women Voters. First it was educating women voters and now it's all voters. It's mm -hmm. been probably for 90 years, it's been for all voters. And we especially promote voter, we, we promote participation in your government. Government is all around us mm -hmm. with all the services that government provides. And the vote empowers people to influence government and you, people may feel like the vote doesn't matter but 100 people is 100 votes 1000 people is 1000 votes so every single vote counts and i think this the work of league of women voters and what we're talking about today also highlights the impact of the the impact for women being uh, politically engaged and engaged in the voting process in the policy making process because we as women, we're not only leading organizations like League of Women Voters, but we're in the boardrooms. Uh, we're leaders in our families, in our homes. And, and, and it's natural for us to also be leading, leading this effort around making sure voters are engaged, make sure that we protect the rights of voters. And we inspire voters uh, to, to really do what they need to do. So uh, I'm so, again, it's happy that you're here today. So let's get started right away. We want to start with the bare bones. A lot of times we assume that folks know, um, what, you know how to vote, how, how to get engaged in the vote, what it means to vote. We make a lot of assumptions. And this day and time, we cannot do that because, as you stated, we need every single voter registered. We need people to understand the power of the vote. And I want to say that again, the power of the vote. I want everybody right. to understand that there is power in this particular uh, 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 privilege that we have to be registered voters. So what are the qualifications to be a voter in Mississippi? You have to be 18 by election day. So I had someone in a class recently that has a birthday October 31st. He thought he couldn't register, but he can. You just have to be 18 by election day, November 3rd. Have to be an, a U.S. citizen and have it lived inside Mississippi's borders for 30 days prior to the election, which would have been by registration day by October 5th. And then there are 23 um, crimes, disenfranchising crimes, they say, so you cannot have committed one of those 23. And, and uh, those 23 crimes are, are going to be important. And, and, and I think we'll, later on in the program, we'll talk a little bit about those okay. uh, because okay. um, people will be very, very surprised. Um, uh, you, now, you're saying that there's 23 crimes that will uh, keep you from voting. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Okay. Yes. Okay. And then there are organizations that help. Um, I believe One Voice will help um, help people get their, their uh, ability to vote back. Yeah. So we can touch on that later. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Now, where can I where can I register vote, and how will I know if my registration was processed? And that's the key. That's important. I know. I know. Uh, people worry about that. Um, the easiest way is to go online, and if someone doesn't have um, a way to go, doesn't feel comfortable going online, I want to encourage everyone listening to help others out, be sure to access the information online because that's now where everything is. We don't even have phone books to find the circuit clerk's office. So I want to refer everyone to vote411.org. It's a League of Women Voters website that will link you to 
the Secretary of State's office and the proper place at the Secretary of State's website, vote411.org. So you can go there and get a mail-in registration form. That's the easiest way. Mississippi does not have, regretfully, we do not have online registration. You have to download the form, fill it out, and send it in or deliver it to the county circuit clerk's office. Mm -hmm. And you can find that online also, county circuit clerk. So now the- the, the... You wanna know Go how to check, okay. How to check to make sure. Um, the circuit clerk's office will send um, a little postcard that will tell you that you're registered and where, what your polling place is. Because of COVID and other things, some places have been moved. So the card will tell you where you go vote, and then you know that um, they received it and you're fine. Another way to check again is vote 411, and it'll say, am I registered to vote? And you can click there and check to see if you're registered. It'll link into the Secretary of State's website um, in the proper place, vote411.org. Now, Kate, can if, if, if a person takes their, if they walk their uh, application, registration form into the circuit clerk's office, will uh, they immediately be registered while they're there on site and be able to get, a, yes. get information on their yes. polling location and yes. everything? Okay. And the sooner you do that, the better. We've got a hit on the deadline, mm -hmm. Willie, because that's October 5th. Mm -hmm. That's that's close. Yes, just a few um, days so away. I'd encourage people to be sure to do it in September. Just get it done. The first week in October, there's going to be long lines there. The fact is, in the circuit clerk's office, they are also doing absentee voting. So there may be a little bit of a line. You hit a, hit a time of day that, that you think may not be as busy. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, too. Absentee um, voting and registration going on right now. And I want to reiterate, too, what we said about do not assume that folks are registered voters. Um, and and, and one, one of the things that Legal Women Voters is doing, we're, we're mailing uh, we're emailing um, the yes. registration forms out to yes. all of our databases. And that's a great idea for all organizations that are listening or all people that are listening. Uh, yes. Why don't you look make that, you say, well, how do I engage people in this process? How can I be uh, um, impactful in this process? One of the things you can do is uh, download a, a, a copy of that uh, registration form, attach it to your email, and send it out to everybody in your database. Um, yes. and asking them and put a little note on the email here's attached uh, attached a registration form if you are not registered voting will you please do that and you may even state why they need to do it or make it a little bit more personal but it only takes us a few minutes to do that in our database with our phones sometimes you're sitting at the doctor's office or you're waiting in line somewhere at Walmart or whatever, get your phone out and be actively engaged in that process while you're doing that. And you will really make an impact because when we, when, when our friends and associates get an email from us, a personal email requesting them to become yeah. voters, uh, it's more likely that they will instantly do that and get engaged. Uh, so don't forget to remind them if you want to do that now, remind them that they have to have until October 5th to do that. So don't wait and put it on your calendar. Do it right now. Uh, do it this afternoon. Do it when you get off work this afternoon. Definitely make sure you do that up to as many people as you can. We want you to be able to be actively involved in getting that done. Um, so I want to give a shout yeah. out to one of our members, sure. Ray Dillon. Sure. Sent it to her church bishop. Well, the church bishop turned around, so she feels like it reached 3,000 people. So mm -hmm. y'all, you really could make a difference. What about in those 3,000 if even 30 were not registered? Mm -hmm. What if 300 were not registered? So you can really make an impact by bringing it to people's attention. And what I found, we were just registering people yesterday. We have so many young people that have not made that step. So make sure the information gets out to um, anyone 18 and over. Now you mentioned, Kay, about even if an individual, a young person is not 18 yet, they can go ahead and pre-register in as yeah. long as they're 18 by election. But let's say if you have a 17-year-old 
Can they register now? They may not vote in the November election, but can they register now or do they have to wait at least a certain number of days before uh, they are eligible? Uh, that is possible in some states. So I, I, I don't know mm -hmm. about here, Willie. Mm -hmm. You would have to ask circuit clerk. Okay. Ours is Zach Wallace for Hines County. Okay, all right. Well, great. Um, now, uh, I think when we talk about the pandemic, because that's been a challenge and we've been, have, been having a lot of engagement around um, absentee voting and why we're really pushing people to take advantage of that because that's going to ensure that we make sure that even those who cannot make it to the polls for health reasons or anything around COVID-19, that we make sure that they have uh, the right to access, exercise their right to vote. So what are some of the challenges, Kay, that we anticipate around uh, COVID and the pandemic uh, around getting to the polls and voting and making sure that everybody goes and do, do that? Um, okay, let's address two things. Mm -hmm. One is if you go in person, they will social distance. They are cleaning it on a regular basis. Masks are not required. Good sense means that we will wear masks when we're in there at the polling place. Um, I encourage people to, the voters, if they're um, of the eligible categories to go ahead and vote absentee. And there are a lot of eligible categories. 65 plus is one of those, mm -hmm. 65 and over, permanent disability, um, temporary disability the legislature did pass legislation so um, if they're under a physician's quarantine for covid that's considered a temporary disability mm. so they can have an absentee ballot and do not need to get it notarized the rest of us need to get it notarized they can just have a witness anyone that's of voting age can witness their uh, absentee ballot. Well, let's pause there a minute, Kay, and let's repeat that. If you're 65 and older, you do not have to have that absentee ballot notarized. No, just disability. Mm -hmm. Disability, someone that's disabled can have a witness. They don't get out of the okay. house. Okay. So they can have um, a witness. However, everyone else, 65 plus, somebody that's going to be out of, um, out of their home county on election day, um, a student away at school, we need to get them notarized. Okay. okay. Um, let's let's mention notarization. Okay. To to have something notarized, the most common place to find a notary public is a local bank. Um, and even if you don't have a local bank, they may notarize it for you. Law offices have notaries. A lot of offices have have notary publics. Um, the post office um, can do it. They don't all know. The law allows them to, but, but they don't all know at the post offices and all the post offices that they can do it, that they're allowed by law to be the one that's witnessing and acting like a notary. Um, so there's you know, City Hall. I called our City Hall and City Hall for someone that lives in a small community, maybe close to their City Hall, and they were willing to notarize. Okay, well, great. And and let's talk a little bit about the absentee process. Kind of walk that through uh, for us also. Okay. Um, I have mine right here. Okay. Okay. You have to call to get an application for the absentee ballot. The application has a lot of small print, but our circuit clerk's office um, asked when I called what category I was in, why I would be eligible to vote absentee. So I'm 65 plus, and they checked it and they highlighted it. No, I'm sorry, they didn't check it. They highlighted it for me to check. And then they highlighted the places where the notary is gonna have to notarize the page. Okay, so this is the application to get the absentee ballot. I will send this in, the circuit clerk after September 21 has now the absentee ballots available that they will send absentee back, the absentee ballot back to me. I have to get that notarized also and send back in. Okay. So, so it is a process. 
The other way to vote absentee is to do it in person. And I just spoke with one of our members who was there this morning and there was not a long line. So she was able to take care of, um, of the whole absentee process and she's voted, she's done. So now yeah. let's reiterate now beginning uh, September 21 through October 31, you can yes. go in, uh, complete your application for absentee and vote at the same at this very same day. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yes. Okay. You can go to the circuit, the county circuit clerk's office to cast your ballot. Okay. Um, and you mentioned the ending date from September 21 to October 31. We can do that. I would not wait until close to the time. I want to say to people, do it just like if you were making an appointment for a doctor's appointment. You know, you you make that appointment and you may have it a week away or whatever. Make a plan for it. And you say, even if it if you happen to hit the circuit clerk's office and there may be some other taxpayers there doing some other work and, I mean, wow. the activity, you make a plan. You say, okay, I'm going to, um, um, on October 1, I'm going into the circuit clerk's office and I'm going to be off work from 8 to 12 and that's going to be my time to get my work done. It may not take you, I'm sure it's not going to take you that long, but I'm just right. saying that let's make a plan. If you, you know, we, and that's the other thing, we're going to be pointing you to a plan, uh, to, that will help you make that plan for voting. Um, uh, and, and we're going to send you to some places where you can get that legal women voters have, uh, Jackson have put together a great voting plan that you can share. And we're going to share that information to you. But right now, let's, let's, uh, let, please put it on your checklist to make a plan to, to vote absentee if you qualify for one of those. Uh, and let's reiterate that again, Kay, before I know you got to, got to step away and I got, uh, our, our next guest on, but let's talk, let's give those, um, um, uh, qualifications for absentee voting. Um, 65 and over, um, temporary disability, permanent disability away from your home county because of work. It might be a nurse that's a seven to seven shift and that's exactly when the polls are open. So cannot get off work during polling hours. Um, away at school, uh, military, all of those okay. are qualifying. Um, let me mention that when people want to know that they the circuit clerks receive the ballot, um, and you cannot once you you ask them to mail the ballot to you, you have to mail it back. You cannot deliver it. Mm. Want to mention that yeah that's important so if you yeah. get your ballot mailed to you you have to mail it back in but if mail you if back. but if you vote at the circuit clerk's office you leave that 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 ballot there uh and so the ending date is election day but i would not wait mm -hmm. until election day it has to arrive by five days after the sooner the better yeah um we haven't even addressed um, everyone that's on the ballot this time. Can I mention that? Well, yes, please. We don't have just the U.S. president, y'all. That there's many more there things that are on the ballot this time. We have the U.S. Senate race between Cindy Hyde Smith and Mike Espy. Uh, we have a state Supreme Court, two districts mm. for our state Supreme Court. Very important. The state flag referendum is on there and the sample, I mean, not the sample, the selected Mississippi flag that we can vote up or down. Also, there's a Mississippi initiative related to marijuana. There's two different initiatives for that. And there's another one about the electoral process. We currently have something that's been on the books for too long, um, uh, for a long time. <laughs> Um, and, and it's called the Mississippi Remove the Electoral Vote Requirement and Establish Runoffs for Gubernatorial and State Office Elections. It used to be, if there was a tie, it would be thrown to, to this the body um, in, in the legislature. And we want to change that so there's a runoff so the, the voters select the person who's chosen for both gubernatorial and, and other state offices. So there's a lot of things on the ballot. 
you can be informed, pull up your sample ballot, and we've mentioned this several times, go to vote411.org to get your, your personal sample ballot. You'll put your, your address in, and it will be your specific ballot. And I think that, and I want people to share, that's why I want people to share vote411.org with all of their family, friends, and relatives, because when we talk about making a plan for voting, that's one of the things you need to do. Because, Kay, you just listed so many different things that I don't think many of us have been thinking about that's on the ballot or, or being aware that's on the ballot. So get that ballot and study it. You want to be able to Google the candidates and look at their platforms. You want to be able to Google the issues that are, there's some issues on the ballot that you want to be able to, to be informed about. Don't, don't just ask a friend or neighbor how you should vote. You need to get the information yourself. Right. Be an informed voter and make sure you exercise your own right. Nobody can speak for you as a voter. Uh, you need to make that choice and, and have your own voice heard. So that's so very important. Kay, you have been amazing as usual. Uh, thank you so much for, for being so informed and, and informing um, uh, the citizens of Jackson and the state of Mississippi through this conversation. And, uh, and thank you so much for your leadership in this organization. One more, I know that this is the Working Women's Report. Mm -hmm. Nearly all of our members have been working and are working, mm -hmm. and it's something that you can do in your spare time. We, wouldn't, we, won't, we won't overburden anyone, and there's many more women out there that feel like the vote is empowering. Mm -hmm. It empowers us. So we welcome members in the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Willie. Thank you for having us on. All right. Thank you so much, and Kay. And Carol's taking over. Yes. I, I love this tag team in this morning. Uh, Carol Anderson um, is, all, is president of the State League for League of Women Voters. And uh, also she's part, she uh, is a, a, a very important person at Mississippi Humanities Council. And so, uh, Carol, thank you so much for being part of the Working Woman Report today and helping inform our citizens. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. All right. Um, we've been talking about a lot of different things and we got a lot more that we want to try to get covered, but I want to hit uh, on just a little bit more about the League of Women Voters. Uh, Kay was wonderful at talking about its history and how long it's been around. But what, are, as a state, you, you, of course, you've led the, the been leader of uh, League of Women Voters Jackson, and now you're, you're president of the State League. Um, what are some of the major issues that are important to League of Women Voters on a national level? Um, many of the same issues that are important to us here in Mississippi. So you'll you'll hear. Um, me list off some things that are important at the national level that are also important to us here at the state level. So um, voter engagement and voter education, um, uh, access to quality health care, um, keeping an eye on uh, any, any infringement on the Voting Rights Act, um, the, and then all across the U.S., individual states will have individual um, variations on how that those positions might um, look in their state or what's being particularly um, uh, is particularly at risk in their state. Yeah, and I think it, when we talk about these particular issues, um, I, I can imagine too, as League of Women Voters been around, as Kay stated, for 100 years, I think she said, and yes. um, uh, in, 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 in these particular times and where we are as a society and in the country, it has to be much more challenging for organizations like League and much more relevant. Um, we need organizations like we, League of Women Voters in our time. I think that the League of Women Voters is um, like other organizations doing similar work, ours as a focus, but yeah, it's about keeping our citizens aware, informed, engaged, and and it's not just our organization out fighting for their interests. It's also involving them, uh, voters and citizens, in knowing what they're what what they have, what they're at risk of losing, and and how to be involved, how to be civically engaged. And I think one of the um, things. Go ahead. 
No, no, that's yeah. it. And I think one of the things, too, is, uh, like you said, with, with League of Women Voters and others, like Women for Progress and so many others, this whole idea of being informed um, and, uh, and educated on the issues, we cannot be uh, impactful in our own lives around these particular issues that impact our communities if we are not informed. If we don't know what the rules are, we don't know what the regulations are, we don't know what the policies are that impact us, we, every single citizen, no matter who you are, no matter what your skin color, no matter what the texture of your hair, no matter if you're female or, or male or, or what age, uh, you need to be informed about uh, the process. Even our young children that are in school, we have to find ways to make sure that they're informed about this process. We can't wait until they become adults. They need to know now uh, how to be engaged in the political process and what that means to their individual lives every day. Um, I think it's so much, they're so very important now because of the new generation that we're growing to, to be leaders for us to have that and be important. So um, speak to that a, bit, a little bit on, on why it's important for us to be engaged. Well, it's everything, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the only way a democracy works is when the citizens are, are informed and engaged. Mm -hmm. I often describe the work of the League as um, th three things, voter education, voter engagement, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, voter registration, mm -hmm. voter education, and voter engagement. Mm -hmm. Those are the three things that, that we think are crucial to a well-functioning democracy. But behind that, as you were saying, is understanding what they're engaging in. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Um, I've got two teenagers uh, who are in high school right now. Uh, I lament this all the time. I feel that the um, um, their government and civics courses are not as rigorous as they That's were right. when I, or maybe I'm not remembering correctly, but I feel they're not as rigorous. And that's, that, that worries me a mm -hmm. great deal. So I've got a child in, um, she's taking her Mississippi studies right now. And I'm really glad I'm in the league right now. Um, I spend a lot of time supplementing what she, she's learning great stuff mm -hmm. about how our constitution in Mississippi was formed. Um, what the leaders at that time were looking to, they were looking to um, what the, the, the common law of England or something, which mm -hmm. was an unwritten uh, set of, um, of, of, of rules and regulations, never written down, just followed. It's very interesting for a student to understand how what they're living under came into being. Mm -hmm. And then what is it that they're living under? And what are the problems with what they're living under? And if they don't like the constitution that they're living under, I'm speaking about Mississippi specifically, um, how can they go about um, affecting change? Mm -hmm. And so that's that education is very, very important. And they also need, um, speaking of younger, um, would-be, soon-to-be voters, they need to feel empowered. They mm -hmm. need to feel that they are um, important to the process, that they, even though they can't vote yet, they have a voice. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think that voice should be encouraged. It needs to be informed and encouraged. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And let's talk a little bit about the challenge around voting around COVID. Um, I know that the league here in Jackson is doing something significant. They're looking at in innovative ways to make sure that people get to the polls, they get to polls early. Of course, we're doing some exciting things about pushing out the, the awareness around absentee voting and why we wanted people to, to, to do that early. Um, uh, I think uh, I like a lot of the little uh, small, th we think are small things, but just as we stated earlier, even asking people to download the registration form and sending it out to uh, their email databases and their friends and relatives. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, other things that um, the league is doing. So talk about some of these uh, kind of innovative things that we can engage in to empower our voting population. Oh, goodness. So there are five local leagues operating around the state. Um, I'm on the state board, and, on, and, and under the state board, there are these five local leagues. There's a league in Oxford uh, that serves um, a two or three county area. There's a league in Meridian. There's a league in uh, 
Uh, Hattiesburg that serves the Pine Belt region, the Jackson League, which serves three counties, and a Gulf Coast League. All of them are very, very involved in exactly the activities you're describing. Um, and they're, they're being remarkably creative in how they um, inform, educate, connect with people under the, the circumstances of COVID. Um, not sure if it's gone into action yet. Maybe it's the Jackson League, but I heard um, that one of our leagues is considering a like a drive-by notary yes. service. So I, I think that's the Jackson mm-hmm. League. Uh, mm-hmm. They're out, you know, rounding up everybody with uh, notary public certification to be available for um, drive-by notary. Mm-hmm. You know, that that, and we can talk about that barrier to mm-hmm. you know that potential barrier to voting, but that's a big one, mm-hmm. and it means you know, getting out of your house and getting into um, a bank. I think post offices still do this. Um, finding a notary public to to, to notarize mm-hmm. your ballot. Mm-hmm. And that's exposure. So folks are reluctant to go. Um, so we're trying not to, you know, to try to, to lower those barriers wherever we can. So right. we can make it easier for them to get something notarized. Um, they may be more likely to um, right. go ahead and vote absentee. So, uh, but all kinds of very interesting ways that, that the leagues are trying to get people um, registered and informed about the election coming up. And I think the big thing is what I like about uh, being part of the league too is how every individual finds the way to engage. And uh, it, there's no particular uh, uh, a set uh, way that you can do that. You can come up with ideas on your own within your women's organization, from your church organization. You all can come up with these creative ideas uh, to get voters engage, uh, engaged. The main thing is to make sure that your organization and you are informed about the rules and regulations and what the laws are. We talked a lot about them early on with Ms. K, and you can go back at the end of this video, uh, this this podcast, you can go back to our page, this same page and go to videos and listen to that again. And then you're talking about ways that you can share this information. Share, uh, go to our Facebook page and go to videos and reshare this informational podcast. Because we're talking everything voting today. Uh, we're every aspect of it. Uh, we, I want to take a moment right now to remind you of a few links that uh that you can reach out to. We talked a lot about vote411.org. A lot of people say, well, I want to make sure that I'm I'm, I'm linking with the link or getting information from the right source. The one thing that we talked about today is the history of the League of Women Voters. It is a trusted entity. They have been fighting for the rights of voters for now 100 years, and they are led by women. So um, this is an organization that you can trust. You can trust that this information has been studied and pulled together and vetted. So you can go to vote411.org and feel comfortable that the information, when you put in your name and address, zip code, and you pull that information up, whether it be your uh, sample ballot or other information about your polling location, you can feel comfortable that you're getting good information. Of course, we're going to always point you to our Secretary of State's office at sos.ms.gov elections sos.ms.gov slash elections. Of course, there's all information there too. On there's a voting guide. There's a voting guide that you can print off. There's other information that you can get around registration and absentee voting and checking all of your information. So definitely go to our your state. Uh, if you're look, listening to us from Louisiana, we have a lot of people listening to us from other states. Go to your Secretary of State's website. And uh, and make sure that you do that. And uh, and and uh, and Carol, if I'm right, saying vote411.org is good no matter what state you live in. Correct. That's correct. Okay, great, yes. wonderful. So even if you're in Michigan, and this is this is what's wonderful, is that when we look at these ways that we can engage and be able to help register voters. Yes, we want to do it in our state. But if you've got relatives that lives in Michigan or Idaho or Iowa, share this information with them also to be engaged. Now, we are a country of no borders from state to state. You know, we're in this thing together. So make sure you're reaching out to that. Also, Women for Progress, we have a voting guide tab on our website at womenforprogress.net, womenforprogress.net. We've also linked the League of Women Voters uh, 
uh, voting plan on our website. So if you want to download a copy of that guide and share it, it's a PDF format and we have it even in JPEG for format. You can share it on your social media. You can download the PDF and share it out by email. There's also links that we just talked about, votefor1.org. There's a link that you can just click on and it'll go right there. The Secretary of State's website is out there. And then there's other information how you can engage with us. We also want to, I want to take this time, if you're uh, interested in uh, becoming a member of the League uh, and, and want to exercise your engagement, your talents, your time, and your resources, please reach out to League of Women Voters. I think it's L, LW, League of Women, LWV.org. Is that right? If you want to join in Mississippi, um, you would go to LWVMS.org. Okay. Okay. So MS for Mississippi. And so you can join as a member at large uh, and just be a general member, or you can join one of the five local leagues. To join one of the five local leagues, you would click from that website to the local league. And each of the local leagues has a, um, a membership registration area. And it's a great opportunity that we, um, we do have a student membership rate of $5. Wow. It's just wow. $5 a year. So we have a couple of student members. These are those rising leaders. They'll come up and lead us one day. Um, my 15 uh, year old has joined. So she's um, a member. I drive her out now and I think she likes it to the voter registration events that we have here in Jackson. Um, she has all the t-shirts. She's got the vote face mask. Um, and by that's, that's really cool because she's a kid out there wearing this, this logo and this message and that's getting shared with kids her age. So we love young members. And the young members get to share also cause they get informed through the league about the, the voting process. And so when the kids see the t-shirts and, and all of the other th the uh, stuff that they use, they can ask the kids to ask questions. Well, what does that T-shirt mean? Uh, what does your organization do? And what a great way to inform other young people about that engagement. Like, well, I want a T-shirt too. You know, what do I need to do to engage? You know, yeah. Willie, I wanted to mention one other um, resource that might be interesting to your audience, and that is the Register to number two register to vote.org it's um again in mississippi we can't register online but it, it, in addition to going to the secretary of state's website for these documents this is a very quick easy way just to make sure if you think you're registered you can double check that you are registered if you are not remembering whether or not you have um, changed your address, if you've moved since the last election, you can check that there too. Mm -hmm. And then you can also download the same forms that you could download from um, the Secretary of State's office. In fact, I believe it may direct you at that point to the Secretary of State's site. Now, Carol, now Carol we can, can we go online um, right now in Mississippi just to change our address? Can we do that online? now or that still requires a paper uh, trail i believe that i i don't want to misspeak i'm okay. not certain whether you can change your address online okay. um i'm not sure okay. about that so let me come back and find out okay. if you want to post that okay it's a very good question okay great um now we have just a few more minutes left but i want to touch on a few things um 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 what if individuals uh, have a problem they get to the polls and um, they have an issue. Uh, they're not listed as a registered voter. What, what does voters need to do at that point? At that point, I think if so, if their address is wrong, um, I believe they have an opportunity to correct that. I think mm -hmm. they should go ahead and vote. And then they're going to have to follow up with their circuit clerk to get that corrected for their vote to count. Um, so they're, they shouldn't they shouldn't leave. Right. They and they should ask on site. You know, what can I do? Mm -hmm. So the, the the staff that's working there should be able to tell them exactly what to do. The one thing they should not do is leave. Yeah. They and we want to say to folks too, when you we got another runoff that's coming October thirteenth, and then we have the November thirteenth election. Remember that 
that when you get there, you have some issues. If they tell you you have to leave and they don't tell you what the next steps are to make sure that you can vote that particular day, you need to make sure you reach out to. You can call us at Women for Progress at 601-259-6770, 601-259-6770, and we will direct you to what you need to do if you can't get your answers there at your polling location. Also, and we, if, they if they can't remember your number, that's yeah. wonder, a wonderful service. Another thing that will be very easy for them. So the league is nonpartisan. So I'm not trying to, to I want to say that the campaigns will know. Mm -hmm. So if you're a registered Democrat, you know who you're voting for, contact the campaign and they will, if they will be able to help you like your organization could to answer those questions if they're not getting those questions answered on site. If they're registered Republican and they're they know what candidate they're voting for, contact that campaign. Um, the campaigns will know as well. Great. So again, and we don't we are nonpartisan, but your campaigns will be helpful as well. Yes, they can be very informed, and I, and I think most campaign campaigns do, do it on that particular day or have people on standby. Uh, to be yes. able to very, very quickly yes. get you the information you need. Because if, you, if you're if you there at the poll at 8 o'clock, you got all day to, to get back, to, to do what you need to do, fill out the forms, whatever you need to do to get it done. So uh, even if it's 6 o'clock in the evening and you have that issue, make sure you reach out to somebody. Uh, please exactly. don't give up. Please don't be discouraged. Um, and there's a lot of poll uh, workers also there. A lot of the campaign um um, staff usually have a poll worker at every single location. Uh, so there should be people there to help you and engage. But we know from previous history that sometimes you, you have some challenges, but we don't want you to give up or be discouraged. Make sure you exercise your right to vote on that day and make sure you insist on it uh, and, and do not give, give up. You have that right to do that. Um, I want to touch a little bit because one of the things when I talk about the work of League of Women about protecting the vote and, and, and its, its mission to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to exercise that right. Uh, just recently here in Mississippi, there was a, um, uh, 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 a charge to get some understanding through the Mississippi Supreme Court around absentee voting. So talk a little bit about that particular case and what came out of that case, what was good, what was not so good, um, and so that we can share with our, our community on that. Yeah, um, so yeah, there was a case um, that was filed. This is some, the, the case you're referencing is not actually something that the league is involved with, although there was a league member mm -hmm. who was among those who testified. So we're very aware of it. We would be aware of it anyway, but this was a, um, Mississippi Center for Justice and the ACLU um, of Mississippi filed um, a, um, a, suit, a lawsuit against the Secretary of State and I think the Rankin County Circuit Clerk's Office um, to try to get um, it possible for voters to vote absentee if they have a medical condition that qualifies as a disability and puts them at a greater risk for COVID if they were exposed. So they... Um, they filed, um, a, a judge had, had given them a hopeful ruling, but it went to the Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Court, um, just on September 18th, they decided that, um, let me give you a quick review that, so they uh, a person may vote absentee if they're under a directive from their physician to quarantine. So they have to have a physician's directive to quarantine. But unfortunately, we we have been watching this and we're hopeful that they would allow that opportunity for anybody who felt threatened by COVID-19 and who were following the, the recommendations of our public health officers. The Supreme Court rejected that portion of it. They did not um, uphold this opportunity to vote absentee for everyone concerned about COVID-19 only for those who have a, a, a physician's directive. So that was the, I think that that's the case you were referring mm -hmm. to. There is a second case that the league is directly involved in. Um, 
this case was filed uh, a complaint filed on August 27th and it was filed by the miss um, sorry by the um, Mississippi Center for Justice and the ACL I'm sorry um, it was filed by the League of Women Voters the Mississippi State Conference of the NAACP and then three individuals who are imagining that they're going to be challenged um, their, that their health will be challenged if they have to go out and vote um, and it's against the uh, Secretary of State and the Attorney General's office. This was filed in um, U.S. District Court. Uh, we it is undecided right now. So the way the way it's the, it, they have until Friday, uh, day after tomorrow, to respond. In the meanwhile, um, we did file. There was a preliminary injunction filed. To we'll see what happens with that. But a preliminary injunction would mean that whatever processes we're operating under right now would have to stop until a decision was made. So barriers to the vote would have to stop until a decision was made. But um, we don't know what will happen with that preliminary injunction. So that is a League of Women Voters of Mississippi case that we're watching very, very carefully. And those are some very hopeful things. Uh, So we're so glad to all those organizations who are moving forward to do whatever they can, however way they can, to make sure that people feel comfortable exercising their right to vote in 2020. So thanks to all of those organizations who are participating in this particular effort. And I want all of us to stay tuned and be alert um, if when we hear over the next few days or definitely within the next week about the outcomes of those particular um, uh, tasks. Um, I want to remind you again, and, and I want to add, I did have a note here. I, you mentioned physician's directive to, to quarantine or to, uh, you know, not to be able to go out, go out. Is that a letter you need to get from your doctor that you have to, that you have to submit with the absentee, uh, uh, a ballot or absentee application, or you just need to have that with you? How, what, what's, What's, what when they say physician's directive do we do we need to actually go through a step of getting a written letter from the physician on that um, I'm sorry I don't know precisely what they're okay. going to ask you for at the circuit clerk's okay. office or by mail um, I'd like to find out for sure before sure. I say for us the the important thing was that for the league was that voters understand that it's their physician has to have made a decision that they would be unsafe going out. Right. What kind of documentation? I'm not quite okay. sure what they have to have. Yep. We had hoped that maybe um, that the the state public health officer's directive yeah. to isolate would qualify as a physician's directive. Right. But it, 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 um, you would um, think so since they've been given that authority. The, uh, yeah. Sorry. I said you would work think, with the other suit, yeah. but we're hopeful it will work with this suit. So really what we want with this suit that's currently um, um, open is that we want we, we just we want absentee voting to be available for everyone. Right. And ever after, not just because of COVID, it should always be something because we all have complications that come up. So we want that. We want the, the issue of having to have things notarized, yeah. um, eased up. Uh, and we want things fixed with this lawsuit. Like, we don't want ballots to be thrown out if your signature doesn't, you know, if, if when they're checking signatures, if they don't match, rather than throwing your ballot out, you should have an opportunity to come in and figure out what happened or re-sign or something. We, the last thing we want to have happen is to have ballots thrown out. So there are a few things that we hope this suit will do. And we, we need, even beyond 2020, we need to stay on, on top of this because even some of the very simple things of moving our voting process to, to uh, this era, like, like have, being able to register online. Um, I mean, you have to go to the polls and you have to show your ID anyway. Why can't I register online? I'm going to have to verify who I am when I get to the poll. That should be a no-brainer for us in Mississippi. Um, uh, and so like it is in so many other states. So these are things that we as citizens are going to have to take a real charge on and be very, very much more insistent on. 
Um, it just does not make sense. We have a lot of things that just does not make sense for uh, in our voting process. And, the and that's exactly it. Things that don't make sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Organizations like yours, organizations like the League of Women Voters, the, one of the best things we can do is that voter education. Voting, the voting laws are complicated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And voting absentee is complicated mm -hmm. and can be. And the barriers are not well known, the little hoops you have to go through. Right. So it's complicated. It's organizations like ours that need to be making that as clear as possible. Clear speech, mm -hmm. breaking it all out. This is what you need to do. These are the potential barriers. It's a lot of work, and that's that's what the league is, is busy with. Well, thank you so much, Carol, for being part of this programming today because we wanted to take our time out today while we still have a few days before October 5th for the deadline for registration, before uh, it, so we can get as many people engaged and informed. That's the purpose of this conversation today, which has been all about voting. And even though it's the Working Woman Report and we talk to women about the work of women, this is work of women, League of Women Voters, Women for Progress, so many other organizations that are led by women who are doing the work around voter engagement, voter education, and voter participation, uh, and policy making. Uh, so uh, I'm so glad to have this conversation today, and we'll continue to share it afterwards. I want to say to everybody, too, that if you don't link by Facebook, I have a lot of folks who don't do Facebook. They said, but, well, I watch the show because I get it on Spreaker Radio, or I get it on iHeartRadio, or I get it on Apple Podcasts, or I get it on SoundCloud, or I get it on Spotify. Um, and look, I, I, the most fascinating, exciting thing that I'm about, I was listening the other morning getting dressed for work, and I was able to get it on Alexa, <laughs> okay? I said, Alexa, uh, play the Working Woman Report. And she played one of the previous shows. Um, uh, so I thought that was the most best thing since since uh, cheese grits, you know. So now the Working Woman Report and all of our program around Women for Progress Radio can be listened to from all over this country, really from all uh, uh, over the world if they have internet uh, capability. So we're all over the place for all of our shows. We have a lot of our archive shows also on our website at womenforprogress.net. And the great thing about these shows are they're not just entertainment based. These are informative uh, radio shows and podcasts that I sometimes go back and listen to shows. We, our radio programming has been around for 10 years. Sometimes I go back and listen to some of the older shows and they are just as relevant today uh, than they were back then. So, uh, and, and, and this is, we're the only radio programming in the state of Mississippi that is created, produced, and hosted by women. So uh, thank you all so much for your support. We could not have done what we need to do without it. Speaking of radio, for my last few minutes, I want to remind you that on Thursday, every Thursday, the Women for Progress radio show, which is our flagship programming, is every Thursday at 5.30 from 6.30. And tomorrow night is our Men Cave edition. Um, and so uh, men will be speaking on the issues. So that's tomorrow night, 5.30 to 6.30. That's the fourth uh, um, Thursday of each month, we have the Man Cave edition. And of course, tomorrow night, they will be on. But listen to us every week. A list of all of our programming is on womenforprogressradio.com. And I, oh, I, but not, I should not mention t t tonight, uh, we have another podcast, The Incredible Dr. Olga Osby. The Incredible Dr. Olga Osby, who he was hosting a podcast tonight called Pathways to Wealth and Wellness. And, uh, and you're talking about some revealing uh, conversations. All of her podcasts, which comes on once a month on Women for Progress Radio, is incredible. So her show is tonight at 5.30 to 6.30. Please tune in right here on our Facebook page and on all of our radio networks to listen to that conversation live you will walk away with a different perspective on issues that is just not on the regular beaten path. So tonight, listen to her show, Pathways to Wealth and Wellness, uh, where she informs us and engages us and always leave with a call to action for us on those particular issues. And that's 5.30 to 6.30 tonight uh, on Women for Progress radio podcast. Want to remind you again to go to vote411.org. 
If you're interested in becoming a member of League of Women Voters, go to lwvms.org, find all the information about what they're doing, uh, your local league, uh, wherever you are, whether you're here in our particular area for Jackson, but there's five other, four other leagues other than Jackson in the state of Mississippi. If you're listening to us from Hattiesburg or North Mississippi or the Gulf Coast, there is an organization in your area that you can help and get, get engaged with. Incredible women, great networking opportunity also beyond all of the voter engagement. So we definitely want to invite you to do that. Uh, on the womenforprogress.net page, there's a voting plan guide that was produced by League of Women Voters. You can have access to and download, and other information is on our page also. Uh, and if you're interested in any programming through our radio program, please reach out to us. Our email is mail at womenforprogress.net, mail at womenforprogress.net. Remind you that Mississippi House District 66 runoff election is October 13th. Um, and uh, so you make want to make sure that you come back again out on October 13th for that final uh, uh, race uh, so we can get, uh, you can speak to your voice to there also October 13th. October 13th, November 3rd, make sure that you right now put on your calendar to make a plan to vote in 2020. So thank you again, Carol, for taking the time out today. Thanks so much for Kay, if you're still listening to us, Kay. Thank you to Kate Broderick, uh, Broadbeck for, uh, for sitting in the first part of our program. And we've been speaking the second half with Ms. Carol Anderson, who is the president of the League of Women Voters for the State League. So thank you all so much for this engagement and have an amazing day. Thank you so much. All right. <music>